So over to you, um, Kelly, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. So um, today we've got a couple of um, interactive slides. If you'd like to jump onto slido.com and just use the participation code 938208, um, and they should come up in real time. So our first question today, how do you or your organisation communicate safety and health information? While you're doing that, yep, email. Um, as occupational hygiene, health and safety professionals, the work you do is vital to reducing the number and the severity of accidents and incidents within the workplace. However, I'd like to ask you this, how effective are we? How effective are the updates and the changes that we are implementing if workplace communication systems and structures are ineffective? We need to go from sending out faceless pieces of information to progressing to interacting with the interface physically, becoming cognitively immersed in the content that we're giving them and proactively spreading the outcomes of this involvement. So as you can see so far, email is the dominant communication channel. Think back to your childhood. Do you remember learning to ride a bike? How to play an instrument? Change a tire? Do your job? How to keep people safe at work? I bet you learned these skills by watching someone else ride their bike, play an instrument, change a tire, by talking to people, and by participating in the process of learning. So occupational health and safety and risks are constructed within a social format, within a social structure. Learning is constantly negotiated and meaning is constructed through those social processes and interactions and activities that take place within everyday workplaces. So I am a social constructionist, um, so I believe that risks are constructed within social systems. So the meaning of risk is intrinsically interwoven into the culture and to the social interactions of individuals, and safety is the result of the collective process of social construction. Organisations construct a specific safety culture and their own definitions of risk and safety. And how an organisation manages occupational health and safety, the way information is communicated, and also a range of factors from a person's background, their experience, education, the industry they work in, what position they have, the sort of duties that their job entails, all influence how risk is constructed and how people understand risk and health and safety in the workplace. So how many emails do you receive every day? Under 50, 50 to 100, over 100, yeah? So the number of emails that are sent every day in, this, in 2022 is over 333 billion. The average person receives 121 business emails every day. For someone that works an average of seven and a half hours per day, that's 16 emails per hour. And that's just the emails that are related to business. Spam or junk emails generally account for about 40% of emails that people receive on a daily basis. So that's 178 emails that an average person receives in one day on one business email account. If it were to take someone two minutes to skim each business email, it would take four hours just to get through these. Realistically, who has four hours to spare to read emails, especially when the information isn't relevant or it's not easy to digest? The communication of occupational safe, safety and health information within the workplace is an essential element for, for a successful, resilient and productive OSH system. Organisations are legally obliged to provide information, training and instruction to their employees and contractors in a way that's easily understood. Even so, individual organisations decide how, when, what or where this information is communicated. 
The channels that are favoured by OSH professionals and organisations haven't changed or advanced significantly over the past 20 years. This is despite substantial developments in technology and individuals evolving communication practices. The relationship between communication and safety has been well established. Cultivating a positive safety culture is critical in the performance of safety within organisations and research demonstrates that communication is important in strengthening the safety climate or culture. However, safety communication often, often occurs within a context of fear and uncertainty as legislative requirements require an organisation to have a formal and legally defensible OSH system, which typically includes censure and sanctions. So how often do you receive mass emails that end up in your unread or even your junk email box? Why do you think this is? It's not relevant. So the quality of information that's generally contained in emails can cause a serious problem. This overabundance of information detracts from the core details that are critical. Sometimes it can be overkill. One of my participants says, I just think sometimes our blokes, you can go too far. You can flood things too much and people don't take notice. It's a bit like road signs. You've got stuff flashing everywhere. You can't concentrate. You're just looking at the road, aren't you? Yeah. So there's too much information. It's too often. It's too many times. <laughs> Ridiculous. Yeah. And you're too busy. So where did we go wrong? It gets to the stage where they become ad nauseum and you don't read them if you get too many of them. They see the document, they see it's legal, and then they, management, wonder why they treat it like it's an ass covering exercise. So these are quotes from some of the people that I interviewed during my research. I don't do that work, so I've got license to ignore that because it's nothing to do with me. You can't rely on one medium anymore. You can't send out an email and think, oh, everyone will get that. Working safely depends upon the successful sending and receiving of relevant information in an accessible and easy to read format. And most importantly, ineffective OSH communication jeopardizes workers' safety. Generally, OSH communication is done in a top-down hierarchical approach. This approach without consultation with employees can result in workers taking less personal responsibility or accountability for their personal safety. And this has potential flow on effects to their colleagues. Employees are particularly cynical about the dissemination of OSH information, and many have adapted to the lack of effective communication with concerning nonchalance. They want OSH communication to improve, but they feel like their communication preferences are ignored, and the channels that are chosen are, are chosen according to organisational convenience. Employees emphasise that they want communication that is tailored to reflect the urgency, the amount and the type of information. It depends on several factors, including the position, so the level and the profession of the employee, whether they work at a desk, do they work in the field, what's their education level, what's their background and what's their experience. Also important is the amount, the type, the relevance, the urgency and the applicability of the information that's being communicated. It doesn't matter how well it's constructed in here. If we don't package it and market it appropriately and communicate that package out effectively, it can crash and burn real easily. So employees believe that the channels used to constitute a major part um, of people of organisations wanting to ensure that they have a legally defensible position. Information is only effectively communicated 
if people choose to engage with it. If information isn't well communicated, then you don't get the buy-in from employees. The biggest concerns that people tend to have is around the amount and the quality of the information. The communication of incident and accident outcomes and also the use of accessible language. Another big concern is around the real world implications of information. So the level and the type of information that is provided is how we need to change the way we communicate to gain employee buy in. We need to ensure that information is communicated in a timely manner, but also how we communicate that needs to be taken into, a, into account. The individual concerns raised by the people that I spoke to reflects the type and the nature of their work. So people who work on the ground are really concerned about translating the information they receive into their daily practices. Managers are concerned around um, work practices and procedures, whereas OSH employees tend to be concerned about engaging people and giving them the right level and type of information. So here's the problem. There's no single channel that works for all employees. And even then, there's no single channel that is going to work effectively for the same employee all the time. Not all channels are appropriate for employees, nor are all channels appropriate for all industries or organisations, or even all working environments or arrangements. Individual preferences are influenced by a range of different factors, including the age or the generation of the employee, the background, the industry they work in, the duties that they perform on a daily basis, their responsibilities, and also their working environment. Email is the easiest and most convenient channel for organisations, but it isn't working. What's the first thing people do when they want to know something? Pretty simple answer. Google it. They Google it because they want information that is relevant to them in simple terms that is easy to understand. So what do employees want? They want short, sharp messages. They want it to be straightforward and to the point. It needs to be relevant to them and their job position and meaningful. The information needs to be of a high quality in an easy to read format and in language that isn't technical or legal or jargon based. They want less negativity and they want to know what the real world implications is are of the information that you're giving them. So what are the questions you need to ask? What do I need to communicate and to whom? What is the information that I'm trying to communicate and what level of employee do I need to communicate this to? How uh, important or urgent is this information? Who am I communicating to? Who is my target audience? How much detail do I need to give? What channels are going to be the most effective to this particular target audience? Think about it. Does everyone have access to emails? What is the best format and language to use for this audience? How can I make this information relevant to this particular audience? And what are the real world implications? Let's have a look at an example. So this is an example of um, a unexpected initiation of a detonator and detonating cord. This is a summary of an incident that um, was sent out in Australia in 2017. So what? What's the information that we need to communicate out from this? Do we need to send the whole document? Is that essential? What is the information that is essential to communicate to each level of the audience you need to communicate to? Think about it in terms of executive staff, executive managers, health and safety personnel, 
managers and supervisors, team leaders, and on the ground staff, or contractors. Each of these audiences may need a different level, a different amount, and more or less detail than the others. For example, health and safety personnel need all of these details, including any regulatory or compliance-based information. Whereas someone working on the ground, their more immediate need is the information that is pertinent to their current job. You can provide links to further information or direct them to where they can find this at a later date. The importance and urgency. So how, is import how important is this information? How urgent is this information? If it's urgent and important, then email is not how we should be communicating this. Is it information of interest or something that can be discussed in the next team meeting or newsletter? When we position information as always urgent and always important, the urgency and importance of all information is invalidated. Who? So who are the target audience? Does everyone in the organisation need this information? Do we need to send a blanket email? Can you relay the urgent and the important information immediately and follow up with further details at a later date or in another format? How much detail? So this goes back to who we need to communicate to and what it is that we need to communicate. Think about it in terms of levels. You may have, say, three major levels in your organisation, which might be management, supervisors and team leaders, and on-the-ground staff. On-the-ground staff don't need the same amount of detail as supervisors or team leaders. And supervisors or team leaders don't need as much de detail as management. How? What channels are the most appropriate? And what channels are going to be the most effective given what information you need to send and who you are sending this information to. The format and the language. Can we reword it into plain English without jargon? How can we make it easier to read and understand? Relevance. Often information is ignored because people don't believe it has relevance to them. Sometimes this might be the case, but when it's, when it is, when it is relevant, we need to make the information pertinent to the people that we are sending it to. Think about electrical safety and you're sending it to people who work in an office versus people who work in the field. They need two very different amounts and types of information. So why would you send the same information to office workers that you send to field workers? Real world. Use real world examples and scenarios. You need to relate the information that you're trying to communicate to the actions or responsibilities of the people that you are targeting. So you need to understand that what's effective for one person isn't necessarily going to be effective for someone else. So what you need to do is consult and actively work with employees around their communication preferences. In one organisation that I worked with, they had a cohort of older workers who not only didn't have easy access to an email account, they actively avoided using this technology. So sending information to this cohort via email obviously isn't going to work. But how am I going to know that unless I have consulted and engaged in conversations with the people I need to communicate to? Even a survey about what their, what their favourite or preferred communication channels are. What channels do they have access to? What channels do they know about? You need to know what channels are currently being used. What are there alternative channels that you're not being used? What opportunities do you have? Why aren't you currently using other channels? For example, at the, one of the organisations I worked with, they had PDAs that almost every field worker had, but they weren't taking advantage of using these PDAs to communicate information. 
we need to choose channels that reflect the urgency, the amount and the type of information being communicated. Something that is urgent, life threatening, an email isn't the correct way to do that. Think about how urgent the information is. Is it something that needs to be communicated now before a job has started? How are we going to get that information across? Use multiple channels. So don't just use email, use notice boards, send out a message on their PDAs, team meetings, take fives, pre-start meetings. You need to tailor the information that you're sending to the positions of the employees that you're sending it to. Don't send a document that is legal and has jargon and technical terms to an employee on the ground who only needs to know that they have to wear this piece of safety equipment when they do this job. Give them the information that is relevant to them instead of bogging everyone down in an information overload. You need to encourage two-way communication and you need to encourage feedback and empowerment the top-down hierarchical approach doesn't work. By gathering feedback and consulting with employees, they're much more likely to engage with the process and with the content. They're more likely to give you feedback and feel that you are going to uh, receive that feedback in a positive light. They're more likely to internalize, promote, and enact the positive occupational health and safety and organizational values. Think about the use of social media to engage a younger generation. A lot of organizations already use social media and a lot of posts can simply be tweaked to include this sort of information. Employ different approaches to communicating this information or starting conversations. So think outside the box. So how do we do this? We need to start by reviewing our current communication strategies. Do we even have a communication strategy? Do we know what the current and available communication channels are? Are there channels that we don't use for a certain reason? Consult with employees about their communication preference and use a whole of organization approach. Talk to your communications and marketing departments understand what channels you have and the communication options that are available, how they work out their target audiences. Develop an employee-led OSH communication strategy. Get the employees involved. You need to regularly review the strategies that you're using and also investigate alternative channels. Social media is one that is completely underutilized by health and safety people. Yes, I said social media. Other industries such as health make use of social media platforms for communication to staff. However, OSH practitioners don't use this tool. Social media has the potential to add significant value to an organization's OSH communication strategy. Information can be communicated in impactful, meaningful ways that encourage engaged, active, two-way communication. Australia has over 20 million social media users. That's 80% of the population. And globally, Facebook is still the most used platform. Australians on average spend an hour and 47 minutes per day on social media. And this has been increasing slowly over the past eight years. More than a third of people now access social media more than five times a day. And almost a quarter of people use social media to follow brands or businesses. It's a quick, easy, fun and fast way of sharing information. Think about the younger generation. Research has shown that they are more likely to search for information on social media than any other source. Think about different ways that you could use social media, such as humorous content. These can encourage 
higher levels of engagement, especially among hard to reach younger audiences. So social media, people inherently enjoy and understand memes. And by using memes, by using pictures, and by using interesting posts, you can promote worker safety in a way that is enjoyable, it's concise, and it's effective. But if you're using social media, you need to make sure you're not just using it because you think you have to. If you're going to use social media, you need to invest the time, the money, and the expertise in this. You need to understand who your audience is, what you want to communicate, and the best way to engage them. You need to understand the difference between marketing and communication. So marketing on social media is the action or business of promoting or selling products or services, which includes market research and advertising. But we don't want to market, we want to communicate. So communicating is the sharing or the exchange of information, news or ideas. Think about a social media uh, platform that you're on and perhaps a company or an organisation that you follow. How much engagement do they get if they send out a generic post? Today is Women's Day. We celebrate the women who work in our industry. How much, how much engagement does that get? What would happen if you changed it up and you changed the way you speak to people? And also start using first person as though the brand or the company is the individual talking to the audience. We celebrate we want to recognize get your audience involved you need to make sure that you're posting and you're responding to comments on a regular basis the structure of the posts need to be have variety this creates individuality and the ability to target different segments of the audience it also creates interest and shows the individual that and the community that you are active within the community and you're interested in what's going on. You need to encourage two-way communication and interaction. Social media isn't a platform for you to just push out information. Interaction is really, really important. Engagement is what you need to aim for. The messages that you, need, you use need to be clear, concise, easy to read and understand. Put the pertinent information up front and then provide links to further information afterwards. So when we talk about OSH accidents or incidents, the overall feeling is quite serious. Straight down the line, right or wrong. And OSH communication is quite negative. But why? Does it have to be? Can we think outside the box? Yes, safety is serious. But do all conversations about safety need to be? Think about some of the best advertising campaigns that you remember. What made them stand out? I guarantee they were different. Another example of conversation starters um, is the Darwin Awards. The Darwin Awards salute the improvement of the human genome by honouring those who accidentally remove themselves from it in a spectacular manner. Now, I'm not saying that these should be used to show what is right or wrong, but they're used as a conversation starter. People are more likely to remember funny material, humorous material, and talk about it with their friends and family than something that is serious, legal, jargon, or technical heavy. So use it to start a conversation. I wanna leave you today with one of my favorite and one of the most iconic safety campaigns in Australia. Just gonna play a short 
a short snippet of this. Set fire to your hair, broke a stick at a grizzly bear, eat medicine that's out of date, use your private parts as piranha bait. So this campaign was uh, done by Metro Trains in order to uh, inform people about the dangers of being around trains. That does come at the end of this advert. I won't play the rest of it. But this is a song that gets stuck in your head. And it's a campaign that has is the most awarded campaign in the history of Cairns. It has gone on to spawn several apps and games. It was in the top 10 of iTunes and it has had several iterations since. And this is just one example of such a great way to engage people when you're thinking outside of the box. This is a campaign that is known in Australia, even today after more than 10 years. Thank you very much for joining me today. Um, I can be contacted uh, at my email if you have any questions and I'm more than happy to have a chat with people. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, Kelly. That's very interesting. And yes, my kids also used to play that a lot. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm just waiting for some Q&A if anybody um, wants to put their questions in there um there is one um so uh um it's from anonymous since organizational social media accounts are often public focus how would you include safety messages to primarily target workers do you have examples so some sort of examples um if you have a look at the aioh uh facebook feed now the AIOH is the Australian Institute for Occupational Hygienists and they have actually taken this on board and they're using this strategy in their Facebook campaigns. And it's about giving information that is general enough to engage people with links to further information if they're interested. Some examples might be, you know, um, we have some days out here that are 45 plus degrees. And it could be messages about, you know, it's hot today. Make sure that we're seeking shade. Make sure that we're drinking water. What about a drinking challenge with your mates today? Like a drinking challenge, a water drinking challenge. And just making it fun and engaging, particularly for younger generations. 
Um, also, social media also creates health and safety risks such as bullying and people not switching social media off. How should we manage this risk? Look, these risks are inherent in society today. And that isn't going to change whether we use social media for OSH or not. If you look at the way that health and health promotion has used social media, they have a fantastic following and health promotion is now primarily done through social media or social marketing, which is something that we don't currently use. Now, using um, posting things that are generally during business hours is one way of combating that, but also making sure that um, people are aware that they're not, they don't have to be a part of these social media platforms. Okay, I was just getting a link. Someone put in a link there about a platform called Poker, which I will drop the link in the um, chat in a second. Um, what are your thoughts on the recent increase of using Teams on top of emails? See, I am a fan of Teams simply because I like the face-to-face -face aspect. It's a great way of being able to communicate to a group of people, even if only you have your video on and they have their video off because it's still effective and it's as effective. Research has shown that it is as effective as face-to-face -face conversations. Okay, um, so we haven't got any more questions now. I'm going to drop a, um, when I find it, a post-event survey in here. Um, I do really like to find out what people want to hear about. Um, moment. And there we go. And there is another question, which I'll get to. Um, IOHS is a safety focused organization, um, though how would a typical organization, say ECU, my H and M, Woodside, we read these safety related messages into their socials, which are generally aimed toward the general public and PR events. So you have to think about the fact that the general public is also your employees. So they're also part of that target market. So small things like, um, uh, let me think, there's an organisation that talks about um, one of the lakes up north and that several people have drowned in this lake. So they might, um, they might um, use that sort of information on their public profile. Um, great place to do this, but be careful because people have drowned. These are ways we can prevent this. Okay, so um, Sharon says, how well do organisations do using screensaver messaging for office workers? Screensaver messaging um, doesn't work very well because people don't actually sit and watch their screensavers. Um, you're better off using uh, interactive communication methods. Okay, so Katrina asked, will we copy of the presentation afterwards? Yes, um, slides and, you know, podcasts and, and videos as well sent later today, Katrina. Um, and Michael says, with so much PC and people being easily offended, it can be difficult to communicate safety any other way other than seriously. Have you experienced this before? Look, some people do get um, offended very easily. The way around that, um, I haven't had that experience personally, and the organisations that I've worked with, I haven't had that experience with them either. If you think about um, bringing up something like safety fails, you know, I saw this on Facebook the other day. I can't believe that this person did that. What do you guys think? The conversation started and it could be, oh my God, that is so stupid. They shouldn't have posted that. But that's fine. That still starts a discussion and it starts that conversation, which is what we really need to do. Just um, to let you know, Sue, so the um, current WH S terminology, WA has just um, updated their legislation to WH and S. Um, and there's a lot of different ways that health and safety is referred to around the world. I grew up with um, safety and health and then went to occupational safety and health. 
and I think workplace health and safety will be the next iteration. So I agree with you. All right, well, there's no more questions. Um, feedback is it's lovely. Thank you, um, Kelly, very, very interesting. Um, I did put a link to that poker platform. I think we'll have a look at that. Maybe they want to do a presentation. So um, yeah, thank you very much. And um, hopefully everyone has a great rest of their week. So thanks, Kelly. Okay, thank bye everyone. Bye-bye.